Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today for a webinar hosted by Vault Product Manager Andy Minos. Today we will be discussing how HashiCorp Vault can help organizations with reaching GDPR compliance. I'd like to introduce you to our presenter today. Andy is the Vault Product Manager at HashiCorp. Um, he will provide an overview of GDPR and the HashiCorp Vault features that assist teams with compliance. We will then spend the second half of the webinar dedicated to live Q&A with all of you. I also wanna note that this webinar is recorded and the recording will be made available after post-processing, usually within a day or two. I'll email it out to all of you. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Take it away, Andy. Sure, thanks so much, Amanda. Hello, everyone. Um, as Amanda said, my name is Dave Minoski, the product manager for Vault here at HashiCorp. And today we're gonna quickly run through the top level of GDPR, sort of what GDPR is, how GDPR applies to organizations that face compliance, um, most importantly, organizations that process data for EU citizens, and then shift over into um, answering just a few questions about GDPR and um, how Vault, um, our compliance um, and identity and secrets management product here at HashiCorp, applies to um, remediating some of these requirements. Um, let's see. Perfect. <clears throat> So first, what is GDPR? So the General Data Protection Regulation um, is a series of uh, very comprehensive um, PII regulations or Personal Identifiable Information Regulations. They were implemented uh, as of um, actually May 25th, 2018, so last Friday. Um, you probably have seen this uh, if you have been reading your email over the last several days. Basically, every site on the internet has been updating its uh, EULA for um, basically regulating how um, your information is tracked and the usage requirements for um, you know, interacting with any kind of data online. Uh, the reason why is because GDPR introduces a series of fairly rigorous requirements on organizations that process PII data. Um, those requirements must be met or else a series of very serious um, uh, penalties are levied on that organization. And we'll go into a little bit of depth about what those penalties are and how they apply, as well as who ultimately levies those penalties. Um, the articles of GDPR span a series of uh, different facets of security, ranging from how information is accessed, um, how information is um, ultimately protected, and then who has access to what information and when. Um, these are stipulated in really three areas, individual rights, the basis for processing, finally governance, accountability, and security. <clears throat> no, um, what's really interesting about GDPR is that, um, you know, like Many organizations that work in InfoSec, uh, you know, HashiCorp has been well aware of GDPR since its original uh, design and implementation in 2016. Um, since the very beginning of uh, GDPR's design, uh, we've been looking at how we can have Vault uh, be able to align with a, a variety of different requirements of GDPR. And we'll go into more extreme depth on each of these, um, but the net of this is, is that many of the major features within Vault uh, focus heavily on um, the very the explicit requirements that an organization may face when interacting with GDPR. Um, so features like control groups, um, Sentinel policies, and ultimately how Vault uh, wraps its cryptographic barrier are not only aligned with how one might uh, meet the needs of GDPR, but are actually uh, aligned with uh, at a very core level. Um, even the names of GDPR, for example, control groups, which was originally released, I believe, in Vault 0 0.89, uh, were originally designed with the name control groups because it's the actual name of uh, the controller rights or dual pro um, or uh, basically the rights around how one might actually manage access to PII data uh, that are actually in GDPR. So it's something that we've been designing from the very beginning um, and ultimately uh, have met uh, many of the requirements throughout the last several releases of Vault. <clears throat> now, why organizations care about uh, GDPR is very simple. Um, the requirements around, uh, you know, the, the penalties around GDPR are, are very extreme. Um, basically, there are two sets of penalties, negligence and non-negligence penalties. Um, the most uh, intensive penalties are the negligence penalties, and the penalties there associated are either the greater of 20 million euros uh, or 4% of global annual revenue uh, for every infraction of GDPR, basically every data breach or security event wherein uh, a set of uh, EU citizens' PII data has been compromised. There's also a set of non-negligence penalties, which is um, half of this, so you know, either the greater of 20 million euros or 2% uh, of global annual revenue. 
Um, the determination of whether or not you are struck with a negligence or non-negligence penalty is a function of what's called the supervisory authority. The supervisory authority is within the EU, whatever is the local government um, that is uh, basically levying these fines and assessing <clears throat> the data breach in question. It's actually a little, you know, um, you know, questionable who actually is the supervisory authority because when it comes to the data, like the regionalization of data, uh, it's supposed to be wherever the majority of the data breach actually physically occurs. Um, however, as one might imagine, um, you know, the determination of this is actually pretty difficult. And technically, GDPR can actually be leveled by multiple um, different uh, supervisory authorities, um, or at least assessed by multiple different supervisory authorities. So you could have multiple instances of GDPR violations. So these violations are very serious and ultimately can you know, pose an existential risk for organizations that process EU citizen data, which is why you've seen such a very quick um, and serious reaction to GDPR uh, throughout most of uh, the tech community, as well as organizations that you know really handle and process EU citizen data online. So we talked about before, um, the split of articles within GDPR are really focused around three things. First, individual rights. Rights for data subjects to dictate how, uh, um, when we say data subjects, we mean EU citizens or people that are regional to the EU um, who uh, ultimately have their data being processed how they are retained, stored, and ultimately used. <clears throat> then there are the basis for processing articles. The, this stipulates who has legal rights to access that data. This is important because <clears throat> in GDPR, data is not, um, it's only processed as a result of a uh, fundamental basis for the processing. Basically, there needs to be the power of acceptance from data subjects to process the data, and there needs to be an explicit usage of that data defined for the period that um, a processor has access to that information. So these are the obligations that are associated with processors, as well as controllers, who are the organizations that um, allow another, you know, either a subset of their own organization or, um, you know, ultimately anyone else that's going to be processing and using that, DI, uh, that PII data how that data is um, you know, used and only used for the basis of that processing. Finally, governance, accountability, and security. This is just the core sort of how is GDPR data, a GDPR data managed and stored, how is it protected, and then what happens during a data breach. Um, as an individual rights, uh, you know, from the individual rights perspective, uh, you know, as a data subject, there are a number of different rights that are associated with GDPR. <clears throat> um, the, to really quickly go through all of them, um, you know, you have rights as an EU citizen to know uh, where and when your data is being used, as well as the power to consent to that data being used. You have the right to erasure, which is the demand that your data is destroyed. What's really interesting about GDPR, and you know, the right to erasure uh, is an example of this, uh, and we'll actually go into more depth on this um, late in another webinar later this week. Um, the focus of uh, right to erasure is on that the data is being destroyed, uh, or at least um, you know has been deleted. Basically, that you have ended the basis for processing of this data, but uh, that data itself, uh, you know, once that, that basis is done, the data is removed. What's very interesting about this is that unlike a lot of other similar types of uh, you know data security requirements. The right to erasure here is actually not stipulated to have a specific type of erasure. So a good example of this is in um, uh, documents such as uh, the U.S.'s NIST SP-800-88, which is the rights, uh, basically the U.S. government's uh, stipulation on what a secure erasure look like in data remnants. Um, while, while GDPR and SP-800-88 are very similar in that they specifically say that, you know, at some point you have the right, uh, that there exists some Bit ending for a basis of processing for data and the data must be destroyed, GDPR kind of stops there and doesn't tell you what destroyed means, whereas SP-800-88 actually specifically goes in depth on sort of what does erasure mean and how is that data destroyed. So it's a very interesting sort of dichotomy here. GDPR is very prescriptive on how, like, you know, what should happen, like when you should have data being used and when you should have data not being used. There must be exists this framework for doing that, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how that data is destroyed. And you'll see this requirement throughout, um, you know, sort of the bulk of the articles of GDPR, where it'll say something along the lines of, you must protect something with encryption. But I'm not gonna tell you what algorithm you should use. I'm not gonna tell you the method upon which you should actually protect something with encryption. You just need to use encryption. Um, so <clears throat> again, one thing to take away from this in terms of how, uh, or rather from GDPR, <clears throat> is the fact that while GDPR is prescriptive around the process, it's not prescriptive mm -hmm. around how something needs to be done necessarily.
Um, rights to object and restrict process, again, in addition to having the ability to consent to your data being used, you have the right to be able to restrict how that data is being used. You also have the ability to make the data portable, so you can be able to export how your like what data is being used, uh, and you know demand access to how that process exists in some form or another. Again, just like with encryption or just like with erasure, GDPR says that there must exist this process to be able to expose this how your data is being used, but it doesn't tell you what exactly that process should be. And then finally, the rest is to be able to lodge complaints when there you believe there's been a violation, as well as the lodge a complaint with the uh, processor or the uh, data controller around when that data should be changed because you believe it to be erroneous. Basis of processing is very simple. Do does the organizations that are controlling access to your data, and then ultimately, um, you know, the organizations that are processing your data have the right to process that data at a certain period of time. Um, you know, whether you are a controller or whether you are a data processor, there are obligations associated with managing PII data, and the articles around basis of processing actually stipulate this. Then finally, governance, accountability, um, and security. Um, like we said, these are articles that are kind of focused specifically around how data is going to be stored, protected, and then ultimately audited as a result of GDPR. Um, you know, articles that are related to governance are going to be talking about, you know, how do you ensure that the basis for processing um, is actually uh, implemented in such a way that processors have least privilege access. And what we mean by least privilege access, we mean that processors are only going to be able to access data that is um, you know, focused around the, the use case that the data subject has actually accepted. So they have consented to their use of data for a specific use case. Um, how do you make sure that the processors can only suit the needs of that use case and don't <coughs> overreach on sort of the access that uh, they have available uh, to that data. Accountability, how do we make sure the processors and controllers are living up to the requirements that they ultimately state? Um, how do we make sure that, they, that their usage of PI data can be audited? This is really important for two reasons. The first is just make, you know, generally to make sure that you are abiding by the principles of GDPR. And the second is that in the event of a data breach, um, you know, that the supervisory authority from whatever region that's processing this data is able to actually review the security controls and GDPR controls that are in place. This is important, again, because this is the difference between a 2% annual global revenue or 4% of annual global revenue in the case of an infraction of GDPR. Finally, security. You know, what? how will this data be protected? You know, you then we go back and talk about, again, GDPR is prescriptive about the process, is not prescriptive about what actually specifically happens. This is very important because, um, again, GDPR tells you that you need to use encryption to protect data. It doesn't tell you what algorithms you use, what ciphers you need to use, what the uh, key length of those ciphers are, et cetera. Um, finally, what, uh, you know, what in the event of a data breach, what needs to happen? There are articles around sort of this process associated with the obligations that an organization faces during this time. <clears throat> now let's dive a little bit deeper into some of the articles of GDPR specifically and talk about how features involved meet these needs. And this is really, you know, an example of uh, how an organization kind of aligns with some of these articles. Vault has features specifically around many of the articles within GDPR, um, but it is by no means the comprehensive solution for all of GDPR. GDPR is a very uh, far-reaching series of regulations, and it's really important to, you know, you know make sure that in addition to using a, um, an open source suite like Vault, that you're actually talk to your compliance officers as well as your uh, internal counsel on sort of how you can align your holistic security practices around many of the requirements for GDPR. So Article 26 basically says that there needs to be a set of controllers uh, who stipulate access to um, for processors to uh, data set versus data. This is important, again, because we need to be able to provide least privileged access to um, data subjects as data during the period in which those subjects consent to their usage of data. Well, within Vault, there's a series of features called control groups, and this is a series of uh, Vault's enterprise features that allow you to map access to a namespace within Vault uh, of features. So, for example, if I have um, you know, a series of user account information that's in dev slash prod, I can actually stipulate that um, accessing uh, any kind of secret in that uh, in that tree and, and, and also in the declining tree from that uh, from the directory structure uh, requires that uh, a identity group of uh, user accounts consents to access that information uh, physically. Um, and now that consent can be um, implemented uh, in an application. For example, you can you can use the API to write an application that you know goes and talks to your phone and says, 
I would like to initiate an MFA transaction that uses the like Duo or Okta to consent to that transaction, <coughs> which is actually a fairly common use case of controls that we see in large enterprises. Um, you can do that um, you know, from the command line. You can do that uh, soon from the UI, actually. Um, there are a number of different ways to implement how uh, the control group's functionality works, but the idea is the same. Basically, you have a group of individuals who consent to access to this information. Articles 27 and 28 focus around um, basically the processor processor rights. These are the individual rights uh, the section of GDPR. Uh, and you know, specifically, there are kind of two requirements here. So um, uh, the first is that uh, processors, again, people that are using data subjects data cannot engage with other processors with the subject data without the expressed consent of controllers. Um, again, it, it, you know, when we talk about the roles that are associated with GDPR, it's the controllers' obligation to ensure that processors have least privilege. Uh, and so one of the aspects of least privilege that are very important from GDPR's perspective is ensuring that you can't just simply take data subjects' data and talk to another processor, um, you know, basically to a the way to think about this is it's almost like a privilege escalation issue. Um, the other processor has a certain scope of their usage of data subjects data. You have a certain scope of the usage of data subjects data. You cannot collude together to basically expand that scope. Um, and it's really the role of the data controller uh, to uh, manage the custody of that data and sort of how processors have access to that data. Now, there are two features with the fault that actually specifically target this. <clears throat> the first is, uh, again, control groups. You know, as a data controller, there are specifically a set of features in Vault Enterprise to be able to implement how uh, you know, individuals, users, and applications have access to data and when they have access to data. Um, finally, there's another series of features called Sentinel that focus on policy as code within Vault Enterprise. Uh, and this allows you to stipulate other heads of um, requirements around, uh, in addition to control groups, around how users have access to data. So you can restrict how processors um, you know, can access data at only certain times. Um, you can only restrict that they can only come in from certain like IP ranges or CIDR blocks. There's a number of different types of requirements around that you can implement around how uh, you know, processors have access to data that align with articles 27 and 28. Finally, the transference of data. Um, we talk about uh, data regionalization, regionalization in GDPR because uh, Articles 44 through 55, which are kind of the, the meat of the InfoSec requirements sections of GDPR, um, stipulate that GDPR is an extraterritorial requirement uh, or is an extraterritorial set of requirements. What extraterritorial means is that it applies everywhere in the world. It does not need to apply within specifically a territory of the EU. It applies where anywhere where that data moves, uh, and as a consequence of that. <clears throat> GDPR stipulates that GDPR data must move to a locale that has at least the same rigor of uh, protection around uh, that GDPR data um, as the EU does. Um, so this is another interesting set of requirements because uh, these articles stipulate that, uh, while these articles stipulate that the, that the rigor must be basically on par with GDPR, it doesn't tell you what that actually means. It doesn't say that you know, you need to have these sets of control requirements. Um, these kinds of rules need to exist. It just basically says that you know the that the the local regulations must be as strict as possible. Uh, most people interpret Articles 44 through 55 to effectively mean that data shouldn't leave the EU because it's really difficult to ascertain whether or not um, a locale has the same kinds of sets of uh, you know like requirements as GDPR. Like for example. Um, this effectively uh, intimates that you know if data was to move from the EU to the United States, that the United States must have regional requirements for MPI data that are just as strenuous as GDPR. <coughs> this becomes sort of a dogmatic question in some cases about whether or not you know is PC the current version of PCI DSS as strong as GDPR. Um, most people wouldn't say that that's not necessarily the case. So the answer that most organizations would um, you know take on effectively is data for EU citizens should not leave the EU um, because you get into sort of this debatable situation of whether or not you're in compliance with GDPR. Um, and depending upon uh, the supervisory authority that might level fines against you, the answer might be no. Um, so there's a set of features within Vault called mount filters that ultimately focus on uh, how data moves uh, physically within your Vault infrastructure. Um, most Vault Enterprise users uh, tend to create 
uh, clusters that are regionally focused. So you might have a cluster that is in, um, say, the EU within France, another cluster that's a backup cluster, a DR cluster within uh, the EU as well, say, Germany. But you might have local performance clusters that uh, applications connect to and use within different locales, such as the United States, within uh, within uh, say APAC, so with Japan, etc. Um, you know, Mount just allows you to stipulate physically what parts of your secrets infrastructure move to these different locales. And that's critical because we built Mount filters effectively to align with this transference of data set of requirements, given how serious um, regionalization uh, and requirements are for Articles 44 and 55 GDPR. And finally, the Articles 35, which is uh, data protection uh, impact assessment. This is important because um, you know this effectively intimates in the event of a data breach, what are the set of auditable elements of your security infrastructure uh, that you must uh, implement to ensure that, at the very least, if you are subject to a data uh, a fine with GDPR, that you show that you are not negligent in those uh, in the impact of that data breach. Basically, you want this mitigate. This drops a potential data breach from a four percent to a two percent in cost. Um, so there are a number of different aspects of Vault's infrastructure, and this is all uh, open source within Vault uh, that you know are, are implemented to meet these requirements. So the audit log, which tells you, um, in addition to who is accessing your secrets infrastructure, when are they accessing it, what are they doing when they're actually within Vault and they failed attempting to access your infrastructure at when that time was, etc. <coughs> Policies which are allowing um, controllers to actually stipulate uh, when processors have rights. You can extend the policies to include things like Sentinel to allow you to, from a more fine-grained perspective, entail what can controllers mm -hmm. access when and how. Um, dynamic secrets uh, and tokens, which are parts of your infrastructure that allow you to uh, ensure that secrets are only accessed for a certain period of time before there's an expiry. Uh, this is really critical for implementing these privilege uh, with it. Uh, and then finally, unified identity. Uh, giving controllers the ability to recognize several forms of uh, identity from regardless of wherever the infrastructure is imp like importing in uh, information. Uh, this is really important because, you know, from a functional point of view, we respect within Vault that there are a number of different ways that a logical user application can um, assert their identity. You know, when you think about your individual identity as an individual, there are a number of different ways that you can stipulate that. You might have a driver's license, a passport, um, a uh, you know, a, an employee ID card. Well, we think about this from a, uh, a data certificate perspective. There are a number of different ways as well. Um, you can access controller. Uh, you can access uh, data from, say, a GitHub account token, LDAP, Active Directory, um, cloud-based identities such as GCP AIM or Azure Cube. Uh, or Azure Active Directory. Unified Identity allows us to streamline the process of asserting who you are logically by linking all these diff uh, different mechanisms together when you're accessing information within Vault and doing so in a way that is very easy to implement. And then ultimately, once you've asserted um, sort of what are the sources of identity are, it automates uh, you know, reflecting that identity with your logical user. Um, this is important because when we think about uh, sort of uh, the taxonomy of a possible data breach, it's very critical to see how a logical user um, may be, a, like, you know, log into your infrastructure, and may, where they may kind of like navigate through your infrastructure, both before they uh, hit Vault and then after when they're in, within Vault itself. <clears throat> and when we look at most complex data breaches within the last five years, we note that um, there is usually a point in time when um, you know the the attacker that's within your infrastructure, whether that attacker is a very sophisticated attacker, such as an AP, APT or advanced persistent threat, or it's an, an adversary that is um, you know of moderate resources uh, and expertise, that they're using credentials that are actually valid credentials. Um, you know they've they've fished out credentials from a user that has accidentally clicked a link from within your organization. Um, they have. Um, you know, via malware, stolen the credentials because they've been using a keylogger and a stolen sort of when someone was typing in their username and password. There's a number of different ways that um, adversaries may gain legitimate credentials. So it's really critical from like an auditability perspective that uh, the users that are, um, or that the security organization that is protecting PII data subject to GDPR is able to analyze the taxonomy of a, of a data breach, especially afterwards to ensure that they understand the scope and exposure of data. And Unified Identity allows you to do that in a really elegant way. So,
the whole focus of the features within Vault uh, around GDPR focused on um, you know implementing how Vault implements least privilege and how at least privilege again is the the concept of the GDPR that um, a processor of data only has access to a certain set of information for a certain period of time. Um, how Vault influence the dual controller requirements of GDPR. So control groups stipulate uh, that um, you have an organization that can, uh, or a group of users uh, that can actually stipulate when processors have access to data. We control the transference and personal data, which is around how do we make sure that given the GDPR is an extraterritorial requirement, that um, data that's um, subject to the requirements of GDPR are only accessed in uh, locales that have at least the same rigor of GDPR or, you know, uh, effectively, how to make sure that EU says it doesn't leave the EU. Uh, security for processing requirements. So this is where transit comes into play uh, to be able to uh, secure the cryptographic barrier around Vault, which is the barrier that protects all of Vault data that's encrypted at rest and in flight. Um, and then finally, the impact assessment. So we support the ability to <clears throat> interact uh, and um, you know, push Vault's a very uh, comprehensive audit log to a number of different places. But in addition to sort of having just the audit log, how do we allow uh, via dynamic secrets, via policies, and ultimately via unified identity as a whole, Vault to comprehensively um, you know, push out information to the audit log about how logical users are interacting via a number of different credentials with their data. So the takeaway from all this, uh, whether you're talking about vaults or whether you're talking about just GD, like any other kind of solution, is that in general, GDPR is a very comprehensive series of requirements. There, It's very prescriptive around um, that there should be processes for when data is used, how data is used only for its necessary period of life, um, and uh, you know, sort of where that the data is portable to, where can that data be moved, who can interact with the data when it's in flight, and then ultimately, when that data is destroyed, um, or when the data is complete, uh, how the data is destroyed. Uh, there are a number of different features within Vault, both within Vault Open Source and within Vault Enterprise that meet the needs of GDPR. But at the end of the day, um, GDPR, while it's prescriptive in the process, it's not prescriptive in how you implement it. So you, what you really need to do is talk to your in-house counsel, as well as uh, you know experts in uh, EU citizen law, and uh, EE regulations specifically within the locales that you intend on uh, suiting the needs of. Because again, GDPR, there's no one single entity that, that stipulates whether or not you are in compliance with GDPR. It is up to the supervisory authority of the different EU citizen states mm -hmm. to determine uh, you know, whether you are in compliance or not. And in the event of a breach of GDPR, whether or not you are subject to negligence or non-negligence penalties. Uh, you need to go and figure that out, uh, given sort of your users and the way they're actually interacting from. Uh, and we provide a number of different tools within Vault to be able to align with these directives with the GDPR and the articles uh, and suit the needs of, uh, you know, many of the supervisory authorities as a whole. And with that, I'd like to shift uh, into answering a few questions. Great, thanks, Andy. Um, so just a reminder, everyone, please feel free to submit your questions um, <clears throat> in the area of the portal. Um, so Andy, first question, um, someone's just wanting some more clarification on, um, do we know how they are going to start, start regulating? So they're asking, okay, it went into effect on Friday. It seems like a lot of companies are still working towards compliance, still m making their way through these things. How do we know when to really um, expect regulation to start being enforced? Good question. Um, the short answer is we don't know. Um, it's gonna, again, depend upon, so the people that are controlling the regulation of GDPR are really the supervisory authorities. Um, of the different states within the EU. So whether we're talking about, uh, so France is sort of, uh, for example, France's supervisory authority is very different from Germany's supervisory authority. Um, when you go onto uh, the uh, European Union site for GDPR, it'll actually stipulate who the supervisory authority is for each different region. So you can go, definitely encourage you to go onto their website and take a look and see um, sort of who do you, uh, who given your user base, uh, the supervisory authority is. Um, many of them have, you know, actively started to enforce GDPR in the sense that 
uh, if there's a data breach today within the within you know places like France and Germany, uh, that they would begin the assessment process of whether or not that data breach was a negligent or non-negligent data breach. Um, but there isn't really a lot of prescription around sort of what each supervisory authority necessarily interprets to be GDP car compliance. And so that intimates that, um, you know, that while enforcement is technically um, is technically in play right now, that they may not actually be enforcing some of the aspects of GDPR because they're st they themselves are still setting up the processes around this. Um, the short answer of this is, or really the, sum the summary of all this is, is that I uh, highly encourage you to go um, onto uh, the EU GDPR website and take a look at who you, your supervisory authority is, given the bulk of the users that interact with your data as a data processor or a data controller. From there, you can go take a look at their website and see sort of what their like their directives are on GDPR, um, and that'll give you a better like, idea of sort of when their regulations are actually in play for that region and what their perspective is on negligence or non-negligence of or GDPR. Awesome. Okay, thanks for the clarification. Um, so now another question, kind of related to that, someone's asking. Um, since this specifically re uh, relates to the EU, um, but obviously a lot of companies based in the U.S., such as us, you know, still have customers there. Um, does this still kind of safeguard U.S. personal data as well, or or do, they're asking, you know, do you think we'll see similar regulation like this in the U.S.? So that's a great question. Um, we don't know. Um, so. It's a good question. Let's 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 tackle this in two areas. First, does this uh, like affect U.S. citizens' data? So, depending upon the supervisory authority, GDPR can be um, the scope of GDPR can be interpreted technically to be uh, for any EU resident data, and so that could be U.S. citizens who are physically within the EU or at least resident to the EU in some form or another. Their data is either physically within the EU or they themselves are in the EU and they are, you know, for example, if you pull out your cell phone, you are in Spain and you are uh, using uh, uh, like telecommunications in Spain, you're interacting with the Spanish website, you know, um, the GDPR can be interpreted to say that, you know, your data, even though you may not be an EU citizen because you're a resident to the EU physically over that period of time, is subject to GDPR. <coughs> So most companies tend to interpret the GDPR requirements to effectively say PII data that is within the EU as a whole. And so that data, given the GDPR is extraterritorial and its implementation, yes, it could be that uh, you know even though you're a U.S. citizen, if you were interacting with an EU system, you could uh, you know your data could be subject to GDPR. Um, the short answer there, though, is you really got to go take a look at who your supervisory authority is. Uh, for your your exposure to EU to uh, EU data as a whole, so who like for example, if you were using EU data of any type, uh, where are the bulk of your users coming from? Um, take a look at who like what what specific country that is, and then take a look at who the supervisory authority is for that country, and they're going to give you more details on their interpretation of GDPR as well as the scope of GDPR. Um, some cities, like some countries may have different requirements. And those different requirements can effectively equate to the scope of GDPR is different uh, for those different countries. Great. Okay. Thank you. And then that second part of their question about uh, do you do we foresee any regulation like this in the U.S.? Has there been any discussion around that? There is discussion about that going on right now. Um, uh, there are a number of different kinds of air aspects of Congress. Uh, brewing some kinds of requirements to around uh, organizations when it comes to data breaches, given that many of the high-profile data breaches in the world uh, struck uh, U.S. systems. Uh, that all being said, we don't know. Uh, sort of, we have to. We'll have to. We'll see where sort of things lie. I, I think the the better like, a way to look at sort of that question of is GDPR going to apply within the U.S. or within China or within other sorts of like major uh, IT bastions within the world uh, is to look at what happens a year from now. Um, you know, there will be data breaches around GDPR. There will be issues that kind of arise 
as a result of um, you know someone gaining access to data. You know, by by virtue of GDPR existing, we will not see hackers stop attempting to access people's information. So what the question is going to be is, after the first sets of um, infractions occur around GDPR uh, and uh, you know fines are being levied. Well, the result, what will the, be the, the result of all of this, the, the social outcry of all of it? And we'll see. Uh, we'll see whether or not this uh, leads to uh, U.S. kinds of versions of GDPR being implemented. Um, certainly, however, there are data regionalization requirements that are coming into play within the U.S. and within other countries like China uh, around the residency of data. So we don't know if there's going to be a U.S. version of GDPR, but it's very likely, at least, there will be more kinds of, like, I would say data nationalization going on where there is, uh, you know, the data, like I, I want to protect the data of my citizens as a nation state. Um, and I want to restrict where the data can be moving. Uh, something like that is very viable. Um, we just don't know if it's going to lead to the same level of rigor as those stipulated GDPR. Okay. Great, thank you for the additional info, Andy. So um, now next question, someone's wondering about the fines. So they're asking, um, are these fines only when data is breached or can one be fined for not implementing GDPR at all? Good question. Um, the short answer there is talk to your supervisory authority because they're the ones that are gonna be like, uh, levying the fines against you. Uh, the longer answer is um, some of the supervisory authorities actually say that if you don't implement GDPR, that is an infraction in and of itself. Um, so again, what you need to do is you need to go take a look at where most of your users are coming from, specifically within the EU, uh, and look at the directives of the supervisory authority there. Um, and you can find, again, the supervisory authorities' websites, uh, the English versions of them, on the uh, GDPR's, uh, uh, the EU GDPR website. There'll be a link off of that. Right. Okay, thank you. And okay, next question. Um, so someone's saying, um, they're saying Vault is primarily a secret store, but it could conceivably act as a secure data store containing some kinds of PII data. Um, would you recommend storing PII in Vault? And if so, would Vault features facilitate GDPR compliance specifically with regards to subject access request and right to erasure? Uh, so not only what I, I, I would what I suggested, uh, it is being used today for these use cases right now. Uh, we have um, major open source and enterprise users who are using Vault in the EU. Um, there are very very large financial institutions, for example, within the European Union uh, that are managing complex PII data uh, for uh, EU citizens today in Vault Enterprise. <coughs> that being said. Um, <coughs> The, uh, the specific questions around sub subject, uh, subject access requests and right to erasure, yes, uh, Vault suits the needs of both of these. Um, subject access requests, uh, we see that within the usage of the controller requirements So and Sentinel. So we talked a little bit about this, uh, actually specifically about the articles that this comes into play in. Uh, earlier, um, the ways that you would implement this are effectively that a control group, who is the controllers for an organization, need to explicitly give access. and you know, GDPR intimates that there exists some kind of process for the controllers to uh, note that consent has been given by a data subject to access this data. Um, and then in addition to that, you can use Sentinel to prescribe other requirements in addition to control groups around how that data is accessed. The second is to write to erasure. Uh, this is actually very interesting. Um, we talked a little bit about this at the beginning, but well, GDPR stipulates that data should be erased, unlike directives like NIST SP 800-88, it doesn't say how they should be erased. There is no such thing as like secure erasure within GDPR. I don't tell you that you need to uh, destroy data by using an electromagnet and then wipe it over the drives. I don't tell you that you need to crypto shred it with a, uh, an algorithm of a certain bit length or security. Uh, instead, uh, GDPR just says the data needs to be destroyed. Um, we have a, a future webinar coming up, I believe, this week with uh, Lance, uh, who's one of our solutions engineers here at HashiCorp, who's actually going to walk through a demo on how you would implement this with G, uh, Vault via crypto shredding. <coughs> so yes, um, Vault is designed to be able to meet the needs of storing PII data, um, and we implement uh, the ability to align with these GDPR directives through a number of different features within Vault. Awesome. Okay. And now um, 
kind of going back to the basics, someone's asking what constitutes personal data? Ooh, the, the hundred million dollar question. Mm -hmm. um, it depends. Uh, it's data that is the easiest way to define it as uh, we talk about PII. So it's data that identifies you as a person. It's your your name, your address, your phone number, et cetera. So anything that can be used to physically identify you from a large wealth of data. Um, but depending upon your supervisory authority, that could be a number of different things. So again, this is why, uh, you know, while Vault provides a number of different features for aligning with the directors of GDPR, <clears throat> excuse me, you really need to go see who your supervisory authority is and they'll give you more like a better uh, comprehensive scope around what they mean by PII data. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why we created Vault was that, you know, uh, for especially for Vault Open Source, that as an organization, HashiCorp definitely felt the need internally for securing sensitive information. And what we mean by sensitive information is any information that you really just don't want it to get out. You feel uncomfortable about the idea of having users' names, users' passwords, users' phone numbers, et cetera, leaking out onto the internet. Um, the best way to kind of like answer the PII question, in addition to saying, go to talk to your supervisor authority, see what their, their directives are, is really to think about what would you get comfortable about being on the internet? You know, as an organization, you uh, have a, a large visibility into your user base. Uh, you know, your users are entrusting you with a, a wealth of information. What would you feel uncomfortable about that being leaked onto the internet? Uh, if you're comfortable about something being leaked, it's generally probably within the scope of GDPR. It's it's something that's PII as a result. So um, the short answer there is secure everything. And why Vault was designed was to allow you to not have to make that sort of dangerous choice of, is this really PII? Do I really need to go spend a lot of time building a key management infrastructure, like a cryptographic infrastructure and other stuff to secure it? Or can I just have something that exists that I can just throw data into that can be protected? And Vault is really designed for a lot of use case. Awesome. Okay, so next question, um, Andy. Someone's asking how the right to erasure aligns with the version secrets introduced in Vault uh, 0.10. Lance is going to go into this uh, an actual demo on this. Um, the the short answer here is is that um, while while uh, the GDPR isn't prescriptive in the right to erasure about how data is destroyed. Um, so stepping back a little bit, my background is in cryptography. I've spent most of my career in cryptography and in uh, you know in meeting the needs and requirements that are actually much more intense than GDPR around secure erasure. Uh, so one of the things that we've designed within Vault is uh, mechanisms that are effectively allow you to implement something called crypto shredding. What we mean by crypto shredding is crypto shredding is a technique where you know you del securely delete delete data by uh, encrypting it and throwing away the key. Um, so what we, there are, you can technically implement secure, you know, er, uh, rights to erasure by having a versioned, uh, secret and then deleting some, uh, you know, destroying. So, uh, for example, in Zvault 0.10, we have, uh, version secrets. You can have versions be either deleted and you have a deletion time. So they're still technically there, but they're removed after the deletion time, or you can destroy that data. So they're immediately destroyed and the version is. Um, you know, not only marked for deletion and not visible with involved, but, uh, you know, depending upon uh, Go's garbage collector, you know, instantly destroyed itself. Um, that, that you could just simply use destroy to be able to align with uh, the right to erasure. I would personally feel uncomfortable with just using, uh, you know, that feature within Vault. There are different ways to kind of deal with a secure, a, a more secure means of erasure by crypto shredding. And Lance is going to go into that because again, all the data within Vault is constantly encrypted. So if the data in Vault is constantly encrypted, what we can do is we can actually remove uh, like aspects of uh, the key infrastructure within Vault uh, at specific times. So if you're using transit, for example, you can, uh, and let's say that the data that Vault is handling is encrypted by transit. Uh, what you can do is you can remove aspects of the, uh, like the key basis if you're using drive keys for your transit. Uh, and what that would do is that would allow you to effectively lose the key and thus you know, effectively crypto shred that data. I would rather implement that approach just because um, it's much stronger when it comes to erasure. There's no question about sort of when goes garbage collector kicks in and deletes the data and whether the data is still in memory. 
because the data is constantly encrypted. I just lost the key effectively for it. Uh, Lance is going to go into more detail about that and actually show you a demo later this week. Great. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, and kind of on that topic, someone asked, are there best practices to process requests for erasure? But it's kind of what you just talked about and Lance will go into on Friday. So, yep. um, okay. And um, next question, uh, do we plan to implement any small things into open source um, for GDPR to be, for GDPR compliance? Certainly. So all of Unified Identity is open source. Uh, the linkage of how you can have different types of likes, uh, sorts of certificates or, uh, you know, you know, linkages between different identity systems like GCP, IAM, AWS, IAM, Azure Active Directory, LDAP, AD, et cetera. That's all open source. Um, you'll see seeing throughout the course of Vault's life more work being done on how we expose um, the locking infrastructure in Vault to be much more uh, like tweakable. So we've already implemented some of this where you can like selectively HVAC certain values in Vault. <coughs> That's really critical from aligning with GDPR requirements around um, sort of the negligence versus non-negligence and what happens during a data breach set of uh, articles for GDPR. Um, um, there are going to be more features that are coming out into open source related to tweaking cryptography and specifically focusing on managing the cryptographic infrastructure of within Vault. Um, so yes, there will be many more features within Vault open source that kind of allow you to easier align, not just with GDPR, but other compliance requirements. Um, typically for the most kind of extreme aspects of compliance, those usually fall within Vault Enterprise's purview. Uh, but we as a company here at HashiCorp take open source very seriously. What we mean by that is that um, <clears throat> regardless of um, whether you are a customer of HashiCorp or whether you're just an open source user who's downloading some, like, some of the tools within HashiCorp, it's really important to us that open source foundations for our tools are still not only viable, but are, are powerful and suit the needs of uh, you know, individuals and large organizations alike uh, in using our tools effectively to solve problems. GDPR is a huge set of problems. So you will continue to see us uh, releasing open source features for Vault that suit the needs of not just GDPR, but a host of other problems around regulation as well as uh, sort of just basically managing secrets, encryption as a service, encrypt and uh, poker's access management. Awesome. Okay, thank you. And okay, next question. Someone's asking, um, is there a deadline that companies must hire a data protection officer by? Do all companies need to hire a DPO? Or is there some sort of size data collection? You know, are there parameters around that? Fantastic question. Um, generally, yes, you do need to have a DPO. Now, that doesn't necessarily need to be a separate individual. <clears throat> Actually, for those of you who haven't uh, read GDPR, the data protection officer is a role within your organization that ensures that GDPR is being followed. And what we mean by that is, is that they are the ones who are implementing in the processes and absolutely the technology uh, that is uh, going to be aligning your organization's infosec with GDPR's set of requirements. So, uh, for example, ensuring that least privilege access uh, takes place for processors for uh, controllers that their obligations are being met and there's controls to allow controllers to, um, you know, cons like to give consent from a data subject, control access to that PII data as it's being processed. Um, <clears throat> this is another question that needs, that, that is, highlights the different nature of your, the supervisor authorities in the EU. Um, you know, usually there, it doesn't need to be a different person. So, if you are subject to GDPR, you might have already a compliance person at your organization. So a person who's in charge of compliance or you have like legal counsel or someone else who, with an infosec whose job it is to ensure that compliance requirements that you have within your order being met, that person could just as well be your DPO. You could also hire a separate DPO, which would make sense, especially if you're a large multinational organization uh, and you know you have different compliance individuals who specialize in compliance for a specific region of the country. Um, there are no size or data collection parameters, you know, other than those specified within GDPR. But really, please go take a look at your supervisory authority for, you know, uh, the region within the EU that you are subject to, because they're going to give you, you know, in addition to sort of what GDPR says, they can effectively levy additional requirements on you, uh, where if those aren't being met, you know, that would be the difference between negligence and non-negligence penalties during an infraction. Okay. Um, so, uh, kind of expanding on that, Andy, I like this question. Um, 
So if different supervisory authorities interpret some of these regulations differently, does one need to go check all the local supervisory authorities' interpretations? AKA if you have customers in Germany, France, UK, Italy, you have to go to all four and be aware of all four. Yeah, you do. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's really the hard part about GDPR. Um, you know, when, when GDPR was first being implemented, uh, there were a lot of people wincing at, at sort of its, its, uh, its requirements. And this is an area where the, perhaps like the more legally adept uh, critics of GDPR, people that were reviewing GDPR, really winced was because depending upon your supervisory authority, the scope of GDPR could be different. The, uh, the requirements of GDPR could be interpreted in different ways. And most importantly, what is negligence and non-negligence may mean completely different things. So uh, the short answer, like the short way to probably optimize this kind of like traveling salesman problem of figuring out sort of who in the EU regulates my data is really to look at where the bulk of your users are. Um, you know, if you have a data breach and you have 95% of your users coming from France and 5% coming from Spain, it's highly unlikely that uh, that Spanish authorities would be the ones that would be dominating sort of the GDPR investigation. It would be more likely that the French supervisory authorities would be the ones that would be heading up that, uh, spearheading that regulation. Um, and while the European Union is a fairly complex legal entity, uh, these supervisory authorities one of the ways that they've been spending the last two years getting ready to implement GDPR is figuring out pan channels of communication between each other. So yes, you could see multiple GDPR violations given a very large data breach. In reality, not every like state within the EU is gonna hit you if you have a data breach. It's gonna be the ones where you have the bulk of your users. So uh, the short answer is if you find out where most of your users are coming from, Consulting that supervisor authority uh, will help. And more likely than not, they'll be helpful in sort of giving you guidance on how they interact with other supervisory authorities uh, during that process. So you don't have to go visit everyone within the EU and see how they interpret like, regulations differently. Yeah. And also, <coughs> a good time to just remind people to also that this is not legal advice to definitely work with your legal team or your outside counsel um, on making sure that you're getting the advice you need. Uh, so next question, um, how does GDPR um, affect policy surrounding data breaches? Great question. Um, GDPR has specific articles to talk about what needs to happen during a data breach around how you harvest the taxonomy of uh, the data breach from your log infrastructure, um, how you message to users with the, and the timeline around the messaging. So, uh, you know, what GDPR is going to tell you is going to tell you that you have a certain period of time to tell users that there's been a data breach. Um, this is important because in the United States, for example, there have been many times where data breaches have taken place, uh, have been discovered, you know, a year or two years prior to uh, its uh, announcement to the public. Uh, GDPR, that's a minimum amount of time for that, uh, you know, or a maximum amount of time for that. Uh, GDPR is uh, focus on the, the taxonomy of your infrastructure. It's very important because for security researchers that are going to be investigating that breach, that allows them to have a very robust set of information so that they can analyze it. And that's important for two reasons. The first is, is that uh, when it comes to discovering who made that breach, data attack attribution is very difficult and giving researchers as much information as possible is critical for good attribution. Uh, the second is that uh, it also allows you to have a good idea about the exposure of that data. You know, um, you know, when you look at data breaches in the past, for example, the Anthem breach, um, there's a very big question after Anthem breach of whether or not all the data, like, you know, what data did the attackers get? What what did they walk away with? Was it social security numbers? Was it <clears throat> was it like, uh, you know, EMR, so emergency, rec like emergency records data? Uh, was it was it data around, um, you know, the, the, the physicality of patients like their x-rays, their prescriptions, all that other stuff. We don't know. The only way that we can figure that out is actually um, through uh, analyzing the taxonomy of the breach. And so providing a lot of information to uh, around how users navigate within an org and infrastructure is really critical for security researchers to ascertain the depth of and scope of that breach. Um, so yes, GDPR stipulates what happens during a data breach. <clears throat> and what needs to be logged during that data breach. Um, and that's how they kind of uh, meet the needs uh, and change sort of the scope of what would happen during a data breach otherwise. Awesome. 
Okay. And Andy, we're going to wrap up with one more question. Um, so someone's asking, uh, is only new data generated after GDPR start date applicable or what is? No, it's all PII data. So uh, me, May 25th just simply says that, you know, we're now going to start regulating GDPR. But if you have EU PII data um, today, it is, it is GDPR data. Um, so, and this is why GDPR is perhaps is perhaps the most like seismic change in like compliance regulation in probably the last 20 years is that we have built up a very large wealth of data around EU, EU residents. So what I mean by that again is that GDPR does not, isn't really just for EU citizens. Any kind of data, PI data resident to the EU. So people within the EU that are US citizens and you know they're accessing it from the EU, et cetera. So um, that data all exists. And it is now subject to the regulations of GDPR. Um, so all that happened in May 25th is that they're going to start enforcing GDPR. But data created before May 25th is just as subject to GDPR data as data is created today. Yeah. Awesome. OK, thank you so much, Andy. And thank you to the audience. Those were lots of great questions. Um, I hope you all enjoy today's webinar and have a bit of a better understanding of the key GDPR articles along with how you can use Vault to address them. Um, thank you for joining and a big thank you to Andy for his time today. Um, you may have noticed he's also a bit under the weather so big thank you to Andy for still joining us today. And I also want to mention, Andy had mentioned this earlier, we have our third and final webinar in this series um, taking place this Friday. So Lance Larson from our solutions engineering team will expand on everything Andy discussed today with an in-depth demo of the Vault features we discussed. Um, I hope you can join us. I'll include the link in the follow-up email um, from today. And you can also find the link on our website at hashicorp.com slash events. And finally, at the beginning, this webinar was recorded and we will make the recording available on our website after processing. Um, I will send everyone an email um, with the recording link that will go to everyone who registered, registered for today's webinar. Um, you can also keep your eyes out on Twitter. I'll post the recording link there a little later today. So with that, have a great day. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.